Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Friday Reads video for August 9th, 2019. Well, to start with, I finally got my July 2019 literary newsletter up, uh, where I include snippets from my Goodreads reviews of the books I read that month, and uh, I have a book pick and a book meme and a TBR and that sort of thing, so I'll link that down below. But I'll just do a quick recap of uh, the books that I uh, haven't talked about since last week. I finished Yaki Delgado Wants to Kick Your Ass by Meg Medina, and uh, I liked it. I, it. Pretty much everything from last week still applies. Uh, I thought it was an interesting uh, foray into uh, teenage psychology about uh, bullying and how to handle it. Uh, I ultimately liked how Medina handled uh, the mother and her own uh, backstory and how that fit into the present storyline. Uh, I like that uh, Pity, the main character, was able to get a decent ending, although it, maybe it would have helped if <laughs> she would have known about it earlier, but I guess uh, that's not the sort of thing that gets uh, advertised, uh, transferring schools to deal with bully issues, although maybe it should if there was a whole bully program uh, going on. I thought of some of the uh, secondary characters were a little uh, flat and... Uh, I'm debating whether or not it's okay, given, you know, the parameters of the story. But ultimately, I think that was the weak spot. I wish uh, they seemed a little more uh, three-dimensional. Although I, I do like how she handled Yaki, the villain, uh, sort of explaining uh, the reasons behind why she did what she did without uh, letting her off the hook for them. Two other audiobooks I listened to came from the Folk of the Air YA fantasy series by Holly Black. First, I read the second book in the series, The Wicked King, which came out earlier this year. This book is uh, touted as a sequel that uh, outdoes the original and uh, was praised a lot, at least from what I've seen online. I'm definitely curious to see how it does with the BookTube SFF Awards next year. The first book made it onto the list this year, and although it didn't win, I don't think it was uh, despised by the judges or anything. But anyway, I uh, think I fell for the hype a little much or something. I, I didn't find it to be amazing. I've read some second books of uh, YA fantasy series that I was kind of over the moon for, like A Torch Against the Night by Saba Tahir and uh, Now I Rise by Kirsten White. Uh, but this one didn't do it as much for me. I, I enjoyed myself with it. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the push and pull of the politics between Jude and Cardin. And also Jude's changing relationship with her sort of dad, Maddox. <laughs> but when it comes to YA fantasy, I think this one might be more on the escapist side than many for me. And I was thinking about why that is, and I think a lot of it has to do with the world building. Even though there are separate kingdoms and fairy and that sort of thing, I never felt like anyone's uh, interest in power had anything to do beyond their own selfishness. And in most world building, characters uh, latch on to ideologies and uh, allegiances to broader, you know, communities. That's my uh, hypothesis for why I'm not quite as head over the heels for this uh, series. Although, after uh, listening to it, I listened to a bunch of uh, interviews with Holly Black, and uh, so something is certainly sticking with me. I'm finding it fun. I'm looking forward to reading the uh, final uh, book in the series. Uh, and so then I, I tidied myself over with uh, the novella that uh, Black published uh, in 2018 uh, called The Lost Sisters. Uh, it's, uh, I think, 50 pages, uh, and it's basically a companion to The Cruel Prince. Uh, it's epistolary in form, uh, told from the perspective of Taryn, who uh, seems to be one of the least liked characters ever. <laughs> And she's uh, justifying some uh, acts she took that betrayed her sister Jude and trying to apologize for them. I think the thing that interested me the most about the novella was uh, why Black wrote it in the first place and that it's not really a story on its own, but uh, it's sort of something for her brand and something to keep uh, interest in her stories going. Uh, I just kept on thinking about uh, marketing and how um, I know of authors who... Uh, you know, send out short stories to people who sign up for their mailing lists or that sort of thing, and that's kind of what this felt like to me. It was a little too simplistic uh, to, to stand on its own, I thought. Granted, I think I'm a little bit biased, uh, because I'm a little bit defensive about uh, feminine characters who get the shaft, as it were. 
and uh, the veneration of badasses all the time. And I gotta say, uh, Black is obviously doing something very right because people are falling hardcore for her characters, at least uh, on Goodreads. Uh, the, the most popular reviews uh, have very strong opinions about the characters. And that definitely is an important part of storytelling and certainly the reason I'm staying invested in this series. But anyway, again, you can read more of my thoughts in my newsletter. Next, I have the book I intended to finish in July, but I just keep holding it back up here. It's uh, The Pale of Settlement, short stories by Margot Singer. I have since read uh, about half of the stories, and they are all interconnected stories. Uh, the first story I read in my Try a Story tag, and uh, I thought the, the main character, Susan, was a little weak. And I still kind of feel like she's mostly a cipher in a way, that she doesn't have as much personality as maybe she should. But uh, interesting things are happening to her and around her, so I can kind of forgive it. Most of these stories have to do with family and legacy. I particularly like the last one I read, Deir Yasin, which um, brought archaeology into it. There's also some politics in this. A lot of the stories take place around Israel. And I will report back when I finish the series, which will definitely be this month at least. <laughs> and then here's my first official finished book of August. Uh, it's The Lola Quartet by Emily St. John Mandel. Uh, for the last uh, few years, in August, I've been doing an author backlist reading project uh, with Meg Wallitzer, and I just finished all of her backlist of adult novels, and I was thinking about who to go to next. And uh, I have such a soft spot for Station Eleven that I figured I should give uh, Emily St. John Mandel's novels a try, her other ones. So hopefully I will be reviewing all three of them in a video at the end of the month. Granted, Station Eleven strikes me as the sort of book that is singular, that it's not so much about uh, the author's style as the specific subject that she chose, and I do feel that way about the Lola Quartet. I enjoyed it well enough, but it wasn't anything on the level of Station Eleven. Uh, it's a mystery novel, a literary mystery novel, I suppose, you know, more uh, in people's heads. Uh, we start with the character of Gavin, who is this... Uh, 20-something newspaper reporter in New York, uh, and he finds out uh, that his uh, girlfriend from high school actually has a kid, and he's able to sort of discern from uh, clues that the kid is probably his. And uh, he ends up kind of ruining his career, and he moves back home, and he tries to track her down, but uh, his girlfriend Anna is embroiled in a much bigger story and a more dangerous story than he realizes, but uh, he's the type of character who uh, likes uh, cracking down clues. If he wasn't going to be a newspaper man, he wanted to be a private detective. And he and we unravel the story of what exactly happened and what danger uh, Anna is in. I found it investing. I kind of wish she uh, hadn't started with the weird prologue stuff that she did, and it took me a while to realize which character was which. I think she just should have started with Gavin in New York, and then... Uh, basically kept the rest of the story the same because we got to go into the past and uh, into the POVs of the other characters involved and kind of know the story before uh, Gavin, which was okay, but uh, that prologue stuff, I, I don't think it was uh, really needed. I thought the characters were interesting enough. I liked uh, Gavin's uh, noirish uh, sensibilities uh, and sort of romanticism in that way. Anna and Sasha certainly felt rather... Uh, affected by abuse they suffered as kids, uh, and uh, I think a lot of the characters uh, were dealing with um, mistakes uh, between high school and college, which uh, cost them a lot in the ten years in between. In that way, I kind of wonder if uh, Mandel went overboard and a bunch of uh, sob stories, such as they were, uh, but maybe not. Maybe it's just, just that type of community. <laughs> which is in Florida, which seems to come with its own biases about messed up people. <laughs> And speaking of settings, I think uh, Mandel did really great with uh, all of her settings and that they felt like fully realized places and you always knew where people were and what they felt about their surroundings and how their surroundings affected them. I like what she did with memory, too, about, uh, especially for Gavin, about, uh, you know, what he was uh, trying to remember from bits and pieces of information. I wish Daniel were a bit more fleshed out. He was a character who was... Uh, sort of betrayed a lot and uh, ultimately changed a lot, but uh, I felt like I didn't get a clear way into uh, his head entirely about uh, 
his guilt, or maybe I did at the very end when uh, Mandel lays out the uh, most incriminating scene. <laughs> this is definitely a plot-driven or a more plot-driven novel than my usual, which is why I feel like I have to be vague with some details. I do think in terms of uh, literary fiction with some plot, this could be appealing to people. So yeah, I thought it was a pretty decent read, and I'm looking forward to continuing with this author backlist. Although, for completely unrelated reasons, really, I feel kind of bad that uh, I'm not doing like a Toni Morrison backlist reading project, uh, because I've been thinking about doing that for a while, and uh, now, unfortunately, she just recently died. And uh, it's quite sad. And so, in fact, uh, because I overplan my reading anyway, I've uh, planned to try to read all of her books next year, so she'll hopefully be my next year uh, author backlist reading. But now I'm on to another reading project because it's Women in Translation Month. This is something that exists beyond me, and I'll link to the website uh, below, and you can certainly find a bunch of uh, Women in Translation TBRs here on BookTube. I try to at least read one book per year, uh, usually something off of my pre-existing TBR, and this year it is The Remains of Love by Zeruya Shalev, and translated by Philip Simpson, but anyway, I will read from The Flap. Hemda Horowitz is nearing the end of her life. As she lies in bed in Jerusalem, the present flickers in and out as memories from the past flood her thoughts. Her childhood in the kibbutz spent under the disappointed gaze of her pioneer father, the lake that was her only solace, and her own two children, one whom she never could love enough and the other she loved too much. Avner, the beloved child, has grown up to be a heavy, anguished man, disillusioned by his work and trapped in a loveless marriage. When visiting his mother in the hospital, he witnesses an unknown couple's final poignant moments together. After the man's death, Avner becomes obsessed with finding the woman and a strange and delicate relationship unfolds. Dina, Hemda's daughter, has put aside her career in order to give her teenage daughter, Nitsan, the warmth she never received from her own mother. But Nitsan is withdrawing from her, and Dina is overcome by a longing to adopt another child, a longing that, if fulfilled, may destroy her fragile family. At once a meditation on the state of modern Israel and a profound exploration of family, yearning, and compromise, Zeruya Shalev's newest novel is electrifying, and certainly in my wheelhouse, because family drama galore from multiple perspectives, I love it. <laughs> I got this novel used, but whoever donated it to the uh, library bookstore uh, obviously got this uh, from the publisher, because here's the sheet, and... Uh, it includes a blurb from Amos Oz, one of my favorite Israeli novelists. An acute and profound statement. One of the most powerful novels I have read in recent years, so that's pretty promising. So that about covers it for me now. I'm hoping to finish The Remains of Love uh, throughout the weekend, but I'm not quite sure. It's a little under 500 pages, which is a little long for me, especially for just a few days. Uh, and I have uh, some plans this weekend. I'm going to a brunch with some friends out of Virginia, which is really exciting. So we'll see how I do. I might uh, slow a little bit into next week. Then hopefully I can finish my next Mandel book quickly, because I got a schedule to keep. Got plenty of other books to get through this month as well, so I hope to be sharing them with you soon. Meanwhile, thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.